The difference between saying and doing. Quite a common observation is, it takes all sorts to make a world. Well, this may well be true. But if it is, where are they all? Self-satisfaction. If self-satisfaction follows an achievement, it was no achievement at all compared to what it could have been. Depression, after supposed failure, means that the attempt was wrongly structured. No real attempt took place, however much it may seem that there was one. Behind the machine Man is generally a few paces behind his own inventions. There are still many people who are revered as figures of authority merely because they can do such things as machines can do more easily. A common example is the awe which people show when faced with someone who has only a good memory or associative capacity, often stuffed with irrelevant facts. This recalls the refrain, Man is not a machine frequently used by people whose work and actions tend more and more to convert men into machines. It is no accident that those cultures which most strongly and often affirm the value and individuality of man are the ones which do most towards automatizing him. Good and bad. There is no philosophical teacher nor system which will tell you to do other than good. You will probably be advised to strive against what is bad. This is the first lesson, of course. But one should want to go beyond. The succeeding lessons are not taught by inflexible principle, nor by ordinary cultivation, nor by standardised exercises. The succeeding lessons are all on what is good and what is bad in the successive stages of a person's life, in the different epochs of a culture, in the various expressions of a teaching. You can only learn this from the exponents of a contemporary school, rooted in the most ancient past, expressing this in institutions designed to be effective. These are not made for attraction value, nor for the robustness of the vehicle. Your problem. I have heard all that you have had to say to me on your problems. You asked me what to do about them. It is my view that your real problem is that you are a member of the human race. Face that one first. Books and donkeys. Anyone can see that an ass laden with books remains a donkey. A human being laden with the undigested results of a tussle with thoughts and books, however, still passes for wise. Specificity The analysis of a situation is one thing. The prescription of the remedy, when indicated, is another. Diagnostic capacity does not prove therapeutic ability. In dealing with human conditions, the procedure almost always has to be specific, not generalised. M-C-O M-C-O stands for Mutual Comfort Operation. One cannot understand the complex advantages and otherwise of human relations without knowing the quantity and quality of mutual comfort inherent in any social contact. History. Right time, right place, right people equals success. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong people equals most of the real human story. The wise and ignorant. When the ignorant have become numerous or powerful enough, they have been referred to by a special name. This name is the wise. Better try something than nothing at all. This appalling statement holds good only in the most restricted fields. A little radioactivity may be worse than none at all. Try to cross a desert thirty days' journey in extent 
with only ten days' water rations, and then see whether the assumption given above fits your case. Proclaiming, however optimistically, that the way to death is a way to life does not alter the outcome if it is attempted with no further knowledge than that. To find a way of life. Primitively damaging supposition underlies most people's thinking about higher knowledge. As a result, they ask the wrong questions about it. They may assume that inner studies are a way of life. They are, in fact, a means which produces the right way of life for each individual. If you apply psychological techniques to your everyday life, you may make progress. But they must be those which belong to the time. And if they are not suitable, you will probably have, on balance, lost a great deal. Many people are better served by self-development, which itself aims at transforming their outer life. But this is not a higher study. Intellectual Exercise I was invited one day to the delightful home of a celebrated savant. Also present were a number of his and his wife's friends, all accustomed to the intensive study of contemporary as well as traditional human thought. After dinner, when we gathered in the drawing-room, the atmosphere having been prepared by three hours of stimulating intellectual exercise, the great man cleared his throat, pulled up his chair, and addressed me. I could see by the expectancy on every face that this was the major turn of the evening. "'I have read such and such a book of yours,' he said, "'and I need not conceal from you that I regard it as being not at all what it purports to be, deficient in material and argument, not justified in its title by its content. "'I am indeed obliged that you should have taken so much trouble with my poor work,' I said. "'I would like very much to hear what you have to say for yourself,' said the academic. "'I told him that it was customary in the assemblies of scholars, so far as I was informed about them, "'to have detailed arguments before being able to attempt to defend oneself, "'much less to try to refute them. "'Would he condescend to tell me in detail what he did not like in my work? "'He would, and did, at considerable length.' He showed great familiarity with my subject, cited book after book to give other people's points of view, and generally gave a display of virtuosity which certainly impressed the rest of the company. All this took about an hour and a half, during which time I, together with the others present, remained silent. When he had finished, I said to him, "'You have certainly covered that field in an astonishingly impressive manner,' Your delineation of my materials and the arguments against them are an experience. I wish that I could do equal justice to my own arguments in defending them, but I think that I lack your academic expertise. I then asked him whether, if he were in my place, he could marshal as impressive an argument from my own part. When he said that he could, I simply asked him whether he could do us all the honour of hearing it. The result was that in just under another hour, so carried away was he by his eloquence and the joy of exercising his intellect, he succeeded in demolishing, point by point, his own case against my book. But the really strange thing was that the rest of the guests, accustomed to worship at the temple of this undoubtedly impressive man, congratulated him on his remarkable mind. Not one of them seeming to notice that he had done my job for me, and had refuted himself and all his cited authorities in the process. I only hope that I am wrong in suspecting that he would have gained an equal amount of adulation had he been reciting, from memory of course, the London Telephone Directory. Reactions Psychologists have noted, quite rightly, that when people are guilty about something, they may react strongly against it, thinking that their behaviour is rooted in other reasons. We all know, too, that an energetic reaction may have nothing to do with the subject apparently being reacted about. We should watch these things. But there is another kind of reaction, too. 
People who are accustomed to being stimulated by coarse or tense impacts feel odd when approached by an often more valuable but generally more sensitive impact. They tend to avoid contact with this by the simple pretext of calling it banal or uninteresting. A sense of anticlimax is to be watched. It may frequently be caused by the desirable disappointment of an undesirable expectation. You cannot be certain to be able to pin down the expectation which was incorrect, or even the assumptions which make you react in this manner. But you can observe yourself reacting in this way. This is an indispensable prerequisite for training to become really sensitive to essential impressions. It is called watching. Caterpillar If you could say to a caterpillar, you were an egg and you will become a butterfly, he would reply, foul beast, or else, you are imagining things or seek to unhinge me, or again, I want to be one now, this instant. Or he might say, Who are you to tell me such things? Or yet again, Yes, show me, while I crawl up this tree. Manoeuvring Many individual problems relating to perplexity and mutual misunderstanding would be solved if people could only appreciate that they tend to try to manipulate one another far more often than is suspected. I have carried out hundreds of experiments in which I and my associates have, instead of taking people's actions and words at face value, assumed that people are trying to score a point, or to assuage anxiety, or to manipulate. This is the kind of experiment which almost anyone can verify. By alternately seeming to agree, to yield, to fall in with someone's suggestions, or to be unconvinced, you can quite easily see this hidden pattern at work. There are two great values in such a study. First, it helps you to dissociate your emotions from what is, in fact, a ritual situation. Second, it shows you what many people are really doing when they are at work or play, despite their own overt beliefs about their activities. Pen Names from time to time, I have had occasion to tell people that I write under names other than my own, pen names. Can you believe that in at least nine instances out of ten, after hearing this, the person has said, Indeed, and what are your pen names? This is a good illustration of the almost complete automatism of much thinking. If people write under pseudonyms, it is surely because they do not want their real name to be known as attached to that writing. Why, then, would such a person be thought likely to tell anyone else what the pen name was? This is all the more remarkable because the people reacting in this way were almost always strangers, comparatively. People who would be supposed less likely than close friends to receive such confidences. The First and Last Battles Not knowing when one is beaten is more generally only a pretty conceit than a rule of life. There is a man better than the one who does not know when he is beaten. This is the man who does not have to know, because he wins. On the same theme, some people seem to make a virtue out of losing every battle but the last. I would, however, recommend them to win the first, in such a manner that it is also the last battle. In higher studies, it is the people who have lost preliminary battles who are our greatest problems. For they may still be in the field, but have never escaped unscathed, and are generally in need of rehabilitation rather than instruction. What goes on inside? When people say, I dislike your opinions, but I believe that you should have the chance of expressing them, always beware. Decades of observation, dealing with actual cases, has shown me that such people are, much more often than not, really saying, I am going to say that this person has the rights I have stated. I might one day get around to trying to live up to this sentiment. But meanwhile, 
I will use other means to combat his opinions, starting with making myself immune from them. Make a sustained study of reputedly fair-minded people before you accept their objectivity. Study their actions and what they say to others, as well as what they would like to think they say to everyone. Perception and Objective Truth Suppose almost no human being could tell hot from cold. People would then not be able to make use of heat or cold. They would be at its mercy. They would find that water sometimes scalded them, sometimes was nice and drinkable. Why this should be, and how they could avoid dangerous water and select good water, might become a ceaseless search. While they were searching, the behaviour of water, and a good many other things, would make no sense, would seem to be motivated by some capricious fate. They would become superstitious about it. They would be attracted to anyone who could tell them something about it, or who seemed able to do so. The fact would be, however, that they lacked an organ of perception, nerves which could signal to them when there was heat and when cold. They would be likely to be in such a permanent state that they would actually conflict with anyone who told them this, though, because it would seem so trite. It would also seem patronising. And, alternating with their credulity towards teachers of the heat-cold problem, would be a demand to be shown evidences indicating what was going on, Someone might say, as we do, that the first necessity is to develop the perceptive organ, and that any argument which was left could come later. But the vicious circle would still be there. Tell me now. Demonstrate it now. Again, since the organ of touch involved in distinguishing heat from cold is specific, and cannot easily be described, even to someone who has other senses, a lot of time and effort is wasted. People think that they can be told what touch is like. When it comes down to it, they can only experience it. Speech merely provides the aid to training touch. The Execrated Sheikh In the country of Ard, there lived a cleric of exemplary habits and impeccable conduct. Over a period of many years, he became respected by the people of his city and a favourite of their ruler. He won, by acclaim, the title of the admired sheikh. From time to time, he used to say to everyone, including his wife and sons, My example is useless to you, because admiration not followed by emulation is hypocrisy of the worst kind. Rather do the opposite of what I do from sheer self-interest than feel happy because there is someone in existence who is good while you are bad. In the last quarter of his life, he ceased to be a moralist and became a Sufi. Inexplicably, the sheikh's outward behaviour took a strange turn. Money entrusted to him by the king disappeared. Rumours circulated about his morals during his absences from home. He refused his children the gifts which they had become accustomed to extracting easily from him. Instead of admirable, people now called him execrated. When he died, his only remaining loyal disciple opened a letter which the execrated sheikh had given him long before to be kept until his death. The letter said, Dear friend, know the explanation of my conduct. Those who have imitated my bad example would never in any case have followed a good one. All I did was to exteriorize their delinquencies in order that they might one day find someone to cure them. The gold, which everyone thinks I stole from the king, is to be found in such and such a place, unspent. Return it to him. In taking it, I taught the king forbearance, bringing his capacity for restraint to the surface where it could be perfected. My wife had learnt patience and generosity through the test applied by my supposed misdemeanours, whose rumours I myself spread from the start. My sons can now support themselves in the world. By denying them what they desired, I caused them to become adaptable and generous, for they do not want to be like me. 
but the greatest test is now upon you. Being faithful, whether you understood me or not, you have perfected only loyalty. Now you have to understand that few things are always what they seem. Hitherto you have taken loyalty as the highest virtue. Now you must learn that it is the very lowest achievement in the ranks of the elect. This is the origin of the founding of the school of the execrated sheikh, whose name is a byword of unreliability among many ordinary people, and equally the essence of perfection among those who know. How people's folly protects them from good by itself appearing to be good. Even today there are many who say, the execrated sheikh had not the grace to confess his sins even after his death. He went so far as to leave a letter which sought to justify his reprehensible actions. Such people are describing only themselves. The King Without a Trade There was once a king who had forgotten the ancient advice of the sages that those who are born into comfort and ease have greater need for proper effort than anyone else. He was a just king, however, and a popular one. Journeying to visit one of his distant possessions, a storm blew up and separated his ship from its escort. The tempest subsided after seven furious days. The ship sank, and the only survivors of the catastrophe were the king and his small daughter, who had somehow managed to climb upon a raft. After many hours, the raft was washed upon the shore of a country which was completely unknown to the travellers. They were at first taken in by fishermen, who looked after them for a time, then said, We are only poor people and cannot afford to keep you. Make your way inland, and perhaps you may find some means of earning a livelihood. Thanking the fisher folk, and sad at heart that he was not able to enlist himself among them, the king started to wander through the land. He and the princess went from village to village, from town to town, seeking food and shelter. They were, of course, no better than beggars, and people treated them as such. Sometimes they had a few scraps of bread, sometimes dry straw in which to sleep. Every time the king tried to improve his condition by asking for employment, people would say, What work can you do? and he always found that he was completely unskilled in whatever task he was required to perform and had to take to the road again. In that entire country there were hardly any opportunities for manual work, since there were plenty of unskilled labourers. As they moved from place to place, the king realised more and more strongly that being a king without a country was a useless state. He reflected more and more often on the proverb in which the ancients have laid down, that only may be regarded as your property, which will survive a shipwreck. After years of this miserable and futureless existence, the pair found themselves, for the first time, at a farm where the owner was looking for someone to tend his sheep. He saw the king and the princess and said, Are you penniless? They said that they were. "'Do you know how to herd sheep?' asked the farmer. "'No,' said the king. "'At least you are honest,' said the farmer, "'and so I will give you a chance to earn a living.' He sent them out with some sheep, and they soon learned that all they had to do was to protect them against wolves and keep them from straying. The king and the princess were given a cottage, and as the years passed the king regained some of his dignity, though not his happiness, and the princess blossomed into a young woman of fairy-like beauty. As they only earned enough to keep themselves alive, the two were unable even to plan to return to their own country. It so happened that one day the sultan of that country was out hunting when he saw the maiden and fell in love with her. He sent his representative to ask her father whether he would give her in marriage to the sultan. "'Ho, peasant!' said the courtier, who had been sent to see him. 
the Sultan, my lord and master, asks for the hand of your daughter in marriage. What is his skill, and what is his work, and how can he earn a living? asked the former king. Dolt! You peasants are all alike, shouted the grandee. Do you not understand that a king does not need to have work, that his skill is in managing kingdoms, and that you have been singled out for an honour such as is ordinarily beyond any possible expectation of commoners? All I know, said the shepherd king, is that unless your master, sultan or no sultan, can earn his living, he is no husband for my daughter and I know a thing or two about the value of skills. The courtier went back to his royal master and told him what the stupid peasant had said, adding, We must not be hard on these people, sire, for they know nothing of the occupations of kings. The sultan, however, when he had recovered from his surprise, said, I am desperately in love with this shepherd's daughter, and I therefore am prepared to do whatever her father may direct in order to win her. So he left the empire in the hands of a regent and apprenticed himself to a carpet weaver. After a year or so, he had mastered the art of simple carpet making. Taking some of his own handiwork to the shepherd king's hut, he presented it to him and said, I am the sultan of this country, desirous of marrying your daughter if she will have me. Having received your message that you require a future son-in-law to possess useful skills, I have studied weaving, and these are examples of my work. How long did it take you to make this rug? asked the shepherd king. Three weeks, said the sultan. And when sold, how long could you live on its profit? asked the shepherd king. Three months, answered the sultan. You may marry my daughter, if she will accept you, said the father. The sultan was overjoyed, and his happiness was complete when the princess agreed to marry him. Your father, though he may only be a peasant, is a wise and shrewd man, he told her. A peasant may be as clever as a sultan, said the princess. But a king, if he has had the necessary experiences, may be as wise as the shrewdest peasant. The sultan and the princess were duly married, and the king, borrowing some money from his new son-in-law, was able to return to his own country, where he became known for evermore as the benign and sagacious monarch who never tired of encouraging each and every one of his subjects to learn a useful trade. The Wise Man and the Critics A certain wise man accepted an invitation to visit a town whose citizens professed themselves interested in his teaching. He went there accompanied by a small group of his disciples. The sage gave a short address. Some of the people said, We do not want a teacher. We want to know how we can find our own way. The sage told a fable. Some of the people said, We do not want to hear old stories. We want guidance. The teacher spoke again on some subject. Some of the people said, This is not what we expected to hear. The teacher made a few remarks. Some of the people said, We do not understand how this speech accords with the authoritative books. As the band made their way from the town, one of the disciples said, I fear that little impression was made, for those people only wanted to behave in a fixed manner, corresponding with the ideas already in their minds. The teacher said, Think well whether the purpose of this expedition was to instruct those who do not want to learn, or to demonstrate their abundance to those of you who may be able to learn. THE AIM It is related that the object of Alexander the Great's eastern expedition was to find the water of eternal life. 
they tell of the occasion when the great conqueror entered the cave in which the spring of life was gushing. Just as he stooped to swallow a mouthful of that liquid, he heard a strange sound from the roof of the cavern. Alexander looked up to see a crow perched in the gloom. The crow was saying, Stop! For God's sake, stop! The king asked him why he should not taste of that miraculous water. I have suffered much in order to be here today, he said. The crow answered, Great king, look at me. I too sought and found the water of life. As soon as I saw it, I ran to the spring and drank my fill. Now, a thousand years later, without the sight of even half an eye, with my beak broken, my claws fallen off, not a feather left, all I ask is that which is impossible. I want to die, and I cannot. Conscious that the aim must be formulated in accordance with knowledge, and not just desire, Alexander the Great stood up and hastened away. The Wandering Baba Attended by a small band of disciples, Chara, the Wandering Baba, went on a journey, visiting the many circles of dervishes which he had established in a number of countries. In Samarkand, the Baba gave a lecture to his followers, and then spent several days separated from them throwing tiny coins to all the children of the town, compelling them to dive into the river to retrieve them. The disciples were not pleased, and the people of the town exclaimed, The sooner this ignorant and ridiculous dervish quits our neighbourhood, the better. In Bukhara, the Baba gave out some teachings, then gathered the people together and told them jokes until the tears ran from their eyes. Some said, This is disgraceful for a man of faith, a teacher and a hakim. Others thought, If this is religion, let us laugh our way to paradise. In short, everyone in that city became addicted to jokes and pranks. In Badakhshan, the Baba initiated some followers and then held classes in singing and dancing, until everyone in that remote province became involved in nothing else. Some people approved, others were profoundly dismayed. When the party reached Kandahar, the Baba told everyone to stop writing and calligraphy, including illuminating manuscripts, until people bit their thumbs with horror and hoped that this disaster would soon pass over them. Soon, however, such was the power of the Baba's example and energy, swimming became characteristic of Samarkand, Bukhara was the home of humour, and in Kandahar a school of painters and miniaturists grew up because people had forgotten how to write. Twenty years later, Chara the Wanderer was dead. One of his disciples relates... I retraced the path which I had followed with my master, and it was thus that I realised what he had really been doing. When I was there, in Samarkand, there was a terrible flood. Those grown men who had been children, taught swimming by the Babas making them dive for pennies, took the rest of the inhabitants on their backs and in this way saved them. When I arrived in Bukhara, a cruel tyrant had seized the city. He was strutting about, trying to impose his will upon the people. But they, accustomed to laughing at everything because of the Baba's jokes, laughed at him so much that he had a fit of apoplexy and fell down dead. In Barakshan, a group of evil men, anxious to extend their sway over the populace, had just brought drugs to the province when I arrived. They said... Take these, and you will gain happiness and fulfilment. The people invariably answered them, 
We do not need your drugs, for we are already completely intoxicated with the dances and revels which the wandering Baba had brought us. In Kandahar, a usurper's edict demanded that all written records should be destroyed, so that all knowledge should seem to begin with his time. But the people, through the Baba's having stopped them writing, had already long since committed all their learning to another form of communication. The ancient law was by now preserved in the designs on carpets, on ceramic tiles, in brasswork, embroidery, decoration of all kinds. Through the wandering Baba, all these people and these things had been saved. Unnecessary. People who have organised their lives around the stability of relative ignorance regard all enterprises which do not fit in with their preconceptions as unnecessary. They seldom pause to think, of course, that unnecessary is the ideal term to preserve ignorance, and especially timorousness. If the good Lord had expected us to fly, he would have given us wings. These are the very same people who would have called scientific research unnecessary, if they couldn't understand it within their own logic system, but who would rush for antibiotics as soon as someone else had developed them. It is unnecessary for the monkey to start to believe that bananas could be cultivated, not just collected, because he is a monkey. It is unnecessary for the savage to question whether fire is not occasionally sent down from heaven by a thunder god, or whether he could make it, because he is a savage. It is unnecessary for a child to believe that we have to earn a living, because he is still a child, even if he has to grow up. It is unnecessary for the adult to believe that he needs intellectual education if he is a manual labourer. It is unnecessary for the educated man to believe that he may need a different or higher form of education because he already defines his state as the best or highest. But nobody can stop the process of learning, real questioning, even if only because our ancestors started on this course many thousands of years ago. They set us on this course, and we cannot escape from it. Lying Look at the phenomenon of lying in its relationship to fools. Fools lie to explain or conceal their foolishness. It is not a remedy, but they use it. Liars, again, are fools because a lie may be found out, and gambling fools are not different from the ordinary kind. The liar fools himself that he will not be found out, and the fool fools himself that his lie will cover his folly. It is not easy to avoid being a fool. It is possible to realise that one has been one. The remedy is not lying. Again, it is possible to realise that one has lied and to avoid it. Foolishness and lying being so much of a continuum, being truthful can help towards being less foolish. It is for this reason, because it is constructively useful, that traditional teachings have stressed the need to tell the truth and be as truthful as possible. Truthfulness means being efficient, effective. Lying is an attempt to make inefficiency into its opposite. This is why all forms of self-deception are lying, and the person who foolishly cannot see the truth can approach it by practice in avoiding, at least for a start, some forms of lying. Many durable moralistic teachings are specific and effective exercises gone wrong. Doubt. Doubt others, and they will doubt you. Do not doubt them, and they may still doubt you. Right and flattering. Not this man or thing is right, but is it flattering me? 
viability. You can keep going on much less attention than you crave. Monstrous suggestion. A psychologist I know noticed that a certain company was promoting its products with techniques which made its advertising nothing less than a campaign of indoctrination. He observed the use of compelling rhythm and jingles, the tension and repetition in presentation, the breaking down of beliefs and the inculcation of new ones. Instead of challenging the firm directly, he thought that he would seek additional information. So he wrote to the head office and suggested that they might well care to profit from the application of knowledge of indoctrination to include in their advertising. Soon afterwards, a letter arrived, signed by the managing director. He was revolted by the suggestion that anyone should try to manipulate the freedom of choice of members of the public. Not only was it, in his view, immoral, but there was a code to help prevent it. How comforting to know that people in authority have set their faces firmly against such abuses. Lichen A piece of lichen was growing on a rock. In addition to the customary lichen thoughts, it often wondered why it could not spread so as to cover a part of the rock which was still bare. There is no lichen nutrient there, said the wisest part of the lichen and we must wait until it comes to us. As the years passed, the expectation of the mass of the lichen became stronger and stronger. Slowly, climatic changes caused the rock to split slightly. Certain chemicals were released and started to ooze outwards, covering a part of the bare surface of the stone. For the devout lichens, this was the answer to their prayers and they gratefully spread themselves over the delicious food. Many years passed, and the chemicals began to become exhausted. This created changes in the character of the lichens, who attributed their difference in composition and being to profound social changes. Theoreticians multiplied, each with his explanation. The lichen philosophers, academics, and scientists divided themselves into groups. You can imagine what their various explanations were like. Each version was based upon the interpretation of observed phenomena. In fact, of course, the theories were generally attempts to concentrate and spread personal convictions. Then, another chain of events caused someone to spill upon the rock another lichen nutrient, and the organisms were able to start growing again. This stimulus itself energised the theoreticians. Their increased anxieties in the immediate past had sharpened their mental activity. It had enabled them to realise the immediate cause of their reprieve and comparative abundance. But so far, the lichens have not got to the point where they can fathom any perceptible intention behind the chain of causes which brings them the means to live and to expand. For this reason, they have given up thinking about it. They believe, nonetheless, that they are thinking about it. But that is only because they are at the level of culture which regards the following statements as thought. Everything is accident. Everything is of supernatural origin. Some things are accident, some supernatural. I do not know what to think. I can believe... And therefore, I can believe that mere opinion is the same as knowledge. I have inferred some things, therefore they are true. I have observed some things, therefore I can observe others. What cannot be observed can be inferred. What cannot be inferred can be felt. What cannot be observed, inferred, or felt cannot have any relevance to anything, and is therefore nonsense. How fortunate that humanity is different from lichen. The Log and the Mushroom 
A rotten log was providing the nutrition for a growing mushroom. As the fungus burst its way through the wood, it shouted, Down with this restrictive institution trying to inhibit my freedom! Other growths, which were spectators, were much affected by the struggle. They said, in admiration, How beautiful is the irresistible heroism of fungi! What a lesson for our descendants! Let us never forget this day! That log thought that it was strong. Indeed, had it not been for the unconquerable spirit of the mushrooms, none would have dared to conceive, let alone carry through, such a glorious enterprise. Some toadstools, which had thrust their way with ease through leaf mould, said, All this effort, this boasting, surely it is unnecessary. But they were soon silenced in the rising clamour from the fungus chorus. Destroy, destroy, destroy tyranny, so that we may have harmony and peace. The Demon's Oath Once upon a time, a certain demon overheard a pious man saying, Would that I could only be tempted, so that I could show that I am impervious to the wiles of demons. The demon immediately materialized before the man and said, I am a demon, and I would like to take you on a pilgrimage to a holy shrine. A demon on a pilgrimage, said the pious man. This is surely something strange. But there can be no harm in going on a pilgrimage, no matter what one's companion is like. To the demon he said, I know good from bad, and it will be no use tempting me, you know. The demon said, Friend, although I am a demon, all I ask of you is that during this pilgrimage you will do nothing harmful to any creature. Stranger and stranger, thought the pious man. Aloud, he said, I will swear that on my oath, demon, for it entirely accords with my own philosophy. And, said the demon, you will also have to swear that you will not kill, and that you will treat others with the utmost respect. Agreed, said the pious man. And if you are a demon, you are the kind which I would most wish to meet for it seems that you are already on the way to reformation. But if this is a trick, mark you, you will find that I am not susceptible to the wiles of the evil ones. Fine, said the demon, and they started on their way. At first halt, the demon said, What do you propose to eat? Meat, said the man. I will not permit that, said the demon because you will be encouraging harm to living things. But it is not now living, said the man. By eating it, you are leaving a place for more meat to be demanded. And by causing meat to be demanded, you are causing butchers to kill. And this is causing harm to living things, said the demon. So the pious man gave up meat. At the next halt, the demon said, Why are you moving that thorn bush? The man said, oh, So that I can sit down. I will not allow it, said the demon, for it will be causing harm to living things. How can that be so? asked the pious man. You have spent too much time in prayers for your own soul to notice that this bush is protecting the burrow of a rabbit which will be left exposed to foxes if you take it away, said the demon. So the bush remained where it was. At the third halt, the demon said, What are you going to do? I am going to light a fire, said the pious man. You may only do so if you can swear that it will not harm any living thing in the earth, said the demon. That night... They slept without a fire. The following day they came to a town. A man was coming down the street, and the pious man thought, I will show this demon 
who seeks to make a mockery of me, that I remember what I promised about doing people honour? So he went up to the newcomer and kissed his hand. Immediately he was surrounded by infuriated local people who shouted, That man is a worshipper of the devil, and you show him honour. They seized the man and the demon and stoned them. When they were eventually released, they were within one day's march of their goal. The demon said to the pious man, Yonder lies the city of the shrine. I leave you here. Now enter it and do good deeds, if you dare.